All right, so I, I, get, the, uh, I get the privilege uh, of kicking off or, or doing the second part of our Genesis series, which um, is a lot of fun, but when you start studying Genesis, who knows this is a deep book? This is a deep book, for real. I started out with one idea. We, we, we went a bunch of different ways. We'll figure out where we land today, all right? I'm, just, I'm, I'm praying it, it has to be God speaking from here because Jeff has nothing going for him right now, okay? All right, so, uh, so uh, if you know me personally, you know two things about me. One, I'm an avid Florida Gators fan. Go Gators. All right, we got one more. Michael, we're getting jumped when we leave here. All right, <laughs> the second thing is I can't go more than a minute or two uh, without talking about London, uh, which she's a little three-year-old if you're out after so You'll see her. She's going to be running around like she owns the place, Okay. Um, which I guess if you don't know me personally, you may need to know who I am, who this random dude is up on your stage talking. Um, I'm Jeff. Hi. I'm the, I'm the youth pastor. Uh, my amazing wife is, well, she, she ran away for some reason. I don't know um, why. But anyway, she, she is uh, uh, the other youth pastor, and, and we have an amazing team. And uh, we have a three-year-old. She thinks she owns this place. And we have a son, which still sounds weird to say, but he will be here in less than a month. And we are, uh, we are excited and nervous and all sorts of feelings about that. Uh, but we're, we're ready. The two-child household, how hard can that be? Um, <laughs> I'm already seeing smirks from parents right now. Y'all know what I'm in for. Man, I don't even know where I was going with all this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't, I can't stop talking about London. That's the part I was talking about. Okay, so how many of you have kids? How many parents do we have? Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, how many parents do love your kids? I'm expecting to see the... I'm, I'm counting. I'm not seeing the same amount of hands, guys. I'm not seeing the same amount of hands. All right. How many of you love when your kids imitate you? <laughs> Me either. We got one. We got one. All right. So let me tell you a story about what happened to me this week. Um, I know a lot of you, I may, this may crush what you think about me. You think I'm perfect. I don't know where you got this crazy idea. I'm not. That was unnecessary laughing. Uh, <laughs> So I was working on a whole home Wi-Fi setup we have at the house because internet has been a struggle and we're not going to go into that, but been trying to fix our internet and I'm setting up this whole home Wi-Fi and I'm kind of techie, like I love working with technology, it's my thing, I went to school for it, like I, I get it. Have you ever been in one of those projects where nothing you do seems to fix anything? Like, like I came into this intending to fix the Wi-Fi, I've now made it worse, Wi-Fi is not available anywhere. Um, and I can't figure it out. I have went to Google. I've went to the instructions. I, I threw it away. Didn't think I needed it. I needed it. Um, I, I, I searched Google. I called some guy named Larry in Louisiana, and like nothing is working. So I don't want to deflate your thoughts of me, but I got a little frustrated, and, and I start like I'm sitting there, and I'm just every time I press a button, it do, it takes like a millisecond to load, and I'm like, come on, you stupid thing, and I you know beat up my dryer because it's its fault. And uh, finally, after probably an hour or so, we, we get it working, and it works great. And you ever, you know that alpha male you feeling you get whenever you finally fix something that was broken? We had that for a little bit, just a little bit. Um, and finally, I was doing good. I was doing good. And, and then so I, I go out to my office, and I'm working on some stuff. And my office is in the garage because we, we have a, a, a small child coming in, took my old office. Um, so now I've been pushed out to the garage. And Lenny was out there kind of hanging out with me, and she has a, a little drivable Jeep out there. And she gets in it, and she's playing around, pretending she's driving, making cool car noises. Um, and I, I know my office is safe for a moment because I've, I've put in the keys securely out of reach. Right? She can't drive over my computer or anything because she would try, I promise you. And she's trying to start it. She's trying to make it go. And then I hear a familiar phrase, come on, you stupid thing, as she's banging on the steering wheel. <laughs> oh. It, it, you feel about this small. I'm like, oh, daddy was a bad role model today. Thank, thankfully enough, I don't actually cuss. I have some sort of willpower there. Um, so she's not repeating anything like that. That's going to get me a lot of trouble while she's running around here. Um, but now she bangs on things and says, come on, stupid thing. Um, we're working on that. We're still chatting about it. <laughs> and I, I accidentally taught her the phrase calm down. So now I hear that all the time. Um, so, <laughs> on that day, I felt like a horrible role model, right? Like, and it's, it's, 
It, it, it was one of those things where I'm like, oh, come on, don't do as I do, which my dad always used to tell me, don't do as I date. Don't do as, don't, don't do as I date. Don't do as I do, do as I say. That's what he used to say. Um, and it, on this day, she did as I did, um, and I was not a great role model. And I think in that moment, I kind of realized, like on, on a deeper level after having a little chit-chat with my three-year-old, is, is I, I started to think she sees everything I do. She's going to imitate everything I do. She's going to say what I say, which is great when I'm saying go Gators. Um, but <laughs> it's just for you, Sam. She's, she's going to do what I do, and I've got to be the absolute best role model that I can be for her. But how many of you know that all of us are going to fall short? So if you're, you're a parent, you're a sibling, you're an aunt, uncle, you're an older peer, there is someone who is looking up to you. There is someone who considers you their role model, and they're going to do what you do. They're going to say what you say. They're going to act how you act. And truthfully, it's a, it's a, it's a little daunting to realize that there are people looking up to you, and they're going to follow you. And are you living in a way that you would want them to act? Because a lot of times, I know myself personally, I fall short. And I don't know if you're in the same boat. I don't know if you're a patience-filled saint all the time. I don't know if you get frustrated with technology when it is stupid and doesn't do what it's supposed to do. But I would imagine if you're sitting here, and if we're being real, you're not perfect, and you make mistakes, and sometimes the idea of someone considering you their role model makes you feel a little ashamed. Sometimes it does for me. And I'm a, I'm a youth pastor. I, I lead students, and I realize that for some students, maybe somewhere, I am some sort of role model. And so I try my best at every given moment to handle the situation at hand how I wish they would handle it. And I try to be that role model, but who knows, sometimes we fall short. And that's why at the end of every youth night, I spend the last 30 minutes pointing them to the one true role model, the one that we should actually follow, the one that we should really base our actions on, and that is Jesus. That is God. That if you follow man, and, and you will, there's going to be someone you look up to, someone you follow, someone you act like and talk like. You, you'll imitate them a little bit, but the one true role model has to be God. He has to be the one we follow. And that's, that's why I personally, I love the phrase WWJD. Um, we wear bracelets. We gave these out in youth group. We did a whole series on them. Um, they don't say WWJD. They say HWLF. And they are simply an answer to what would Jesus do. And it's HWLF. And it means he would love first. He would love first. And, and so I try to base all of my actions through the lens of what would Jesus do. He would act in love. He would act in love first. And he would act in love and he would act in truth. And, and so I try to base and let Jesus be my role model and the one that I follow. I try to also be a representative of Jesus because I know since I wear the title, especially of a pastor, but also just as a Christian, as a church attender, as someone with decent morals, you are a representative of Jesus to the world. Do you know that? That people are looking at you at work. They're looking at you at the grocery store. They're looking at you when you drive out of here. Yeah, guys, when you drive out of here and you're in the safety of your own car, how you react when you leave this parking lot, people are looking at you to determine who Jesus is. You are a representative of Jesus to this world. And that's a lot to bear. But if we look to him and we look and we realize that we are made in his image, that we are image bearers of the one true God, and that we are to follow him, it makes a difference. And so today what we're going to be talking about is, I already kind of gave it away, we're going to be talking about the image of God and, and what that means and what that should look like on each and every one of us. Um, so we'll be starting in, in Genesis 1-1. I won't spend too much time on there because Dennis did that fully and thoroughly last week. So we're going to be reading through that and then we're going to go through creation a little bit and, and do some cool stuff like that. All right? So let's start reading in Genesis 1-1. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. 
So on, uh, by the way, the message is titled God's Work and Our Work. And on day one, we see that God creates light. The very first thing, he shows up and he says, let there be light. On day two, God creates the sky. Day three, God separates land from sea and creates every seed-bearing plant and tree. Day four is interesting because God creates the sun, moon, and stars God had already created light on day one. How is the sun, moon, and stars just coming around on day four? We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Day five, God creates the sea creatures and the birds of the sky. Day six, this was a big one. God creates the livestock, all the wild animals, and man in his own image. And on day seven, God rested. That is um, the, the timeline of creation. Uh, but one thing that I, that I found interesting through this study through is is that a lot of times what God would do is he would do something and then he would tell creation to follow his lead, that he would tell creation to follow him, basically use him as a role model for what it should do. For example, on day one, God created light. We, we can, many scholars believe that God himself was the light on day one, that he produced the light. And then on day four, he created the sun, moon, and stars to be the light that he started as the light and then he created it to be the light, that he taught creation how to follow him in what he's doing. We see the same thing if we look in verse 11 at day three of creation. It says, Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit and seed in it, in it according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. You see, God spoke, and vegetation sprouted, and it, and it came forth. And, and then he instructed it to follow his lead and to produce more vegetation and, and, and produce more um, a fruit and, and to keep producing to, to follow God's lead. You see, uh, for creation to work correctly, it must follow the ways of its creator. To work correctly, creation must follow the ways of its creator. We see this all through Scripture. When Adam and Eve were following the ways of the Creator, everything was in perfect harmony. Everything was perfect. It wasn't until they rebelled away from the ways of God and they, they fell away from their Creator that literally everything fell through. It, it was then that mistakes happened. Whenever creation follows the ways of its Creator, all things exist in perfect harmony. And I don't think this is uh, the, the way we see with the, with the light and with the vegetation. We see the same thing with mankind on day six. So let's start reading in verse 26. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw... All that these had, uh, saw all that he had made, and it was very good, and there was evening, and there was morning on the sixth day. God creates humanity in a way that humanity should follow him. Now, he uses a unique phrase here. I'm sure we've all heard it. He uses the phrase, the image of God, image of God. Um, and I decided to look a little further into that phrase, um, and apparently it's highly debatable. Um, what different people believe in, in different backgrounds and things like that, it's, it's all very different. Um, but most can come to an agreement on one thing. So, so first, what a lot of people believe, a lot of people believe when we're saying image of God, we're talking about the actual physical, literal representation of God, that, that God essentially looks like a human. Based on the Hebrew here, we cannot conclude that this is true or untrue. Um, so it's a maybe and sort of a pointless debate, though later in the scripture it tells us that, that God is spirit. Um, God is also everywhere. So there's... there's there, there's a lot that goes into that. So does God actually look like human? Did he create us in his physical image? Who knows? 
We'll ask him when we get there. We'll probably know. We'll probably know pretty clearly uh, when we get there. Um, some believe that, that the image of God has to do with our intelligence, our, our ability to rationalize, our ability to have emotion, our ability to communicate, because all of these things are relatively unique to, to humans. Um, but that theory kind of falls short in the fact that those are not all equal amongst all of humanity. Um, obviously, some people are smarter than me. Does that mean they are more in the image of God than me? Also, some people are born without the ability to communicate, the, the ability to have or show emotion, um, or the ability to rationalize. Does that mean they no longer have the image of God? So that's, that's where it sort of falls short, because when we read it in Genesis, the image of God seems to be given out equally to all of mankind. And, and so sort of the, 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 the Bible nerd explanation uh, that I, I found really interesting is that a lot of scholars now believe, based on the, the Hebraic syntax of the word used here, the, the Salem, is, is that the image is, is that when we read it, rather than reading we are made in the image of God, we should read it as we are made as the image of God. Okay, let me explain. So let's say we're taking verse 27, and you would read it as God created mankind in his own image. But now if we switched in and as, you would say, so God created mankind as his own image. So notice, it's not that the image of God is a quality that is tossed onto mankind. It's not, oh, look, you're a human. Here, have the image of God. It's that you are, that is what you are. You are the image of God. You are the representative of God on earth, that you were created with the purpose to be a representative of of God to creation. And we see that how God gives man dominion over creation, that he gives him the, the plants and he gives him the animal and he gives him the authority to rule, which is a little bit translated differently how we think. We think of kings that rule and, and go out like that. Really, it was more a, a, a call to cultivate, to create, a, a call to, to replenish and, and, and make the world fruitful. So we are called not it doesn't always mean that we're necessarily in the physical image of God, and maybe we are, I don't know. But it is that we are created to be a representative of God on earth. So you and I, humanity, are created for a reason, for a purpose, that each and every one of us has a calling. Now, we can read in Genesis 2, God gets more specific in, in what his calling is for Adam. Um, so in Genesis 2, verse 7, it says, then the Lord God created a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted in a, gar a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. Now if we jump down to 15, we see what happens. He says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. That, that Adam was essentially put into the world, put into Eden, so that he may work it and take care of it. You and I, made in the image of God, we are created to work and to take care of the creation God has made. We are created and we are unique in, in multiple ways, but one is that we are created in the image of God, and, and we can have relationship with God, that we can have communion with God, and that he has given us the authority to take care of his creation. So, I guess the question we get into now is, okay, why does that matter? Why does any of this matter to me today in 2020? Um, I got to, like, go out and, and face the world. We ain't growing anything. We're not cultivating. We're certainly not ruling. What does that mean to me today? And I think we have to fast forward to the New Testament. You see, God in creation... When he created mankind, he created him in his image in the Imago Dei, that he created him to rule, that he created him to be a representative of God here on earth, that we are to take care of it um, the way that God would take care of it, and we are to take care of creation. You see, Adam and his family were given the duty to be a representative of God to creation, and you and I, as children of God, as followers of Jesus, we are called to be a representative of Jesus to humanity. We are called to represent Jesus. You see, in the beginning, God gave a command to Adam, take care of what I have created, be fruitful and multiply. About 2,000 years ago, Jesus gave a command, take care of what I died for, bear fruit and multiply. You see, we still have a call on our life. We still have a purpose. We still have a reason that if you are a follower of God, if you are a follower of Jesus, you have a reason, a purpose. You have, God has a plan for your life. 
that he wants you to go out. You see, I believe there was a great commission in Genesis, and it was to rule over the beasts and, and, and the fish and take care of the garden and replenish the earth. We also have a great commission in the gospel. It's to go and make disciples of all nations. To, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Teach them about repentance. Teach them about the one true God who came and died for them. We have the Great Commission. And that is our job today. But Christians, are we doing that? Because I, I don't know, I looked up some statistics and I, and I thought it was kind of interesting. There are 2.3 billion Christians worldwide. 2.3 followers of Jesus worldwide. That's a phenomenal number. That's amazing, really. It was actually higher than I, than I thought. But the problem comes in, at least as of last night, I found a live tracker that is counting the births and deaths, so you, have, you know exactly the population. It changes by the second, um, millisecond probably. 7.7 .7 billion people worldwide. So I, I, I you know, put my math skills to work, and I came up with 5.4 billion non-Christians. 5.4 billion non-Christians. And if you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe the scripture, then we have to believe that that means there are 5.4 billion people that aren't going to make it to heaven unless the hands and feet of Jesus go out and reach out to them and share with them the gospel and show them the love of Jesus. And we go and we accomplish the Great Commission. Unless that happens, hell is going to be full. And that is daunting. The number is daunting. It is. But did you know 5.4 billion starts with one? It starts with one. And we see all throughout. Because the interesting thing, there's 2.3 billion Christians. And so we either believe that that started with 12 lunatics that weren't afraid to die and they just wanted to lie for the fun of it. Even through excruciating death and torture, they held their lie. Or it started with the one true God. And he gave us the calling to go out and reach the nations. But we've grown to 2.3 billion people, and I can't help but imagine what would happen if 2.3 billion people tomorrow just got turned on fire for Jesus. That if they went out and they truly wanted to reach their towns, reach their communities, reach their family, reach their friends, if they went out and they truly loved Jesus and they loved the world and they wanted to save the people around them, what would happen if 2.3 billion people took the mission of God to the people who don't know God and they showed the love and, and showed people the value that Jesus has in them? What if he, they went out and, and just had the passion to tell the people around them, about who Jesus is. I believe that we could see peace on earth. I believe we could see the world reached in a single day because we're not talking about addition. We're talking about multiplication because when you get someone on fire for Jesus, they're going to tell someone else and they're going to tell someone else and they're going to tell someone else and it keeps going. It's like a big, it's like the snowball from Dave Ramsey, shameless plug, that it keeps on rolling, rolling, rolling and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and you have a movement. But listen guys, a wave starts with one. It starts with one. Be the one that gets the wave going. So Christians, why are we not doing it? Why are we? I'm including myself in that. Why are we? I'm not at, the wa at Walmart every time I see a cashier asking her if she knows Jesus, where she's going when she dies. Don't do that. That's weird. Okay? I, I'm a Christian. I've been a pa I was a pastor for like four or five years. And someone approached me at the fair and asked me a question. I'm like, oh, no. Like, I, you don't catch someone off guard with that. You show love, guys. You show up and you love on people, and, and you care, and you be the face, the feet, and the hands of Jesus, that you reach people, and you reach out, and you help, and you bless, and then you share the one who saved you. So why don't we do it, though? Sometimes the cost is too much. Can we, can we throw that picture real quick? Um, speaking of role models, uh, I heard a, uh, one of my role models the greatest, football call, or greatest quarterback college football has ever seen, Tim Tebow, he told a story about this photo. Uh, played for the greatest team in the world. But, uh, okay, he told a story about this photo, uh, and I, just, I had to share it. So this is a photo um, of a little girl. She's trying to make her way from the village um, to a, a feeding center that's just a short ways away. And as you can see, she is so malnourished, and she's moving so slow that there is literally a vulture behind her waiting to attack. Now there's a young man, he wanted to make a difference. He wanted to do something. 
And so he actually went to this country so that he could photograph. He was a professional photographer. He went to photograph and tried to raise awareness for the situations in the world. And he's seen this happen. And he pulled up his camera and he took the photo. And he wanted to do something. He really did. He wanted to make a difference. But he was also told that because of the diseases and the, and the sickness in the area, that, that he wasn't allowed to touch anyone or, or interact in any way. And, and so he had to keep his distance from this little girl. And, and, and he, would, he would go up and he would shoo the vulture away, but as soon as he would start to walk away, the vulture would come back. And he would shoo the vulture away, and as soon as, the, as, soon as he would, the vulture would come back. And, but he had been told not to, not to interact and, and not to act and not to touch and essentially not to help. And so he didn't. He eventually just walked away and left her. We don't know the rest of the story for her, but we know his story. He was amazingly successful. In fact, this photo made it to the New York Times. It is one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential images in the world ever taken. He won a Pulitzer, which is a huge honor for a photographer. The greatest honor for a photographer is to win a Pulitzer. And then four months later, he takes his own life. He had amazing success. And he realized it wasn't enough. I have to imagine that this moment, that this day, it aided him. Because he could have made a difference. He could have acted. He could have scooped up this little maybe 15-pound girl and carried her to the medical tent. He could have, he could have carried her to the feeding center. He could have helped. Yeah, there might have been a cost. There could have been a disease. There could have been a sickness but he could have found help, but he could have made a difference. Every day, you and I are walking out into the battlefields of the world, and we are interacting with people that are caught in the trap of the devil. They're caught in the trap of the enemy, and right now they're not facing death. They're facing eternal damnation. And yet we're saying the cost of being socially awkward is too much. I don't want people to think I'm weird. I don't want people to think that, that I'm judgmental, that I'm hateful, or that I go against the grain of culture. We are talking about eternity. And I truly, I pray that this little girl made it, but we don't know. But what we do know is that I, I pray that there were missionaries there and that this little girl had a chance to hear the gospel. And I pray that today she's sitting in heaven. That if anything did happen today, she's sitting in heaven and she's smiling because she has eternity in heaven and joy and glory but there are people we interact with every single day that are facing eternal damnation because they don't know Jesus. Our call is the call of the Great Commission to go and save people. Introduce people to the one who saved us. You don't need any, any special qualifications. You don't need to know the entire Bible through and through. You simply have to know your story about how God saved you, how God changed your life, and you share that with someone else. And if they have any questions, you know what you say? I don't know. Come with me to church, and we'll ask someone who does. You see, but so many people will spend their life chasing success. They'll spend their life chasing money, or a job, or a trophy. Do you know there are dumpsters full of trophies that people work their entire lives for? Success is temporary. Success fades away. Success is unfulfilling. I did a Google search this morning, kind of wish I wouldn't have of celebrities who took their own lives. Some of them I knew, some of them were on my Disney shows. And I imagine they worked their entire life for the success that they achieved, only to realize it was not enough. Only to realize the success they thought they wanted, the success they dreamed about, the success they worked their entire lives for was unfulfilling and it made no difference in their life. Yes, they had money and they can do whatever they want, but it was not enough. You see, because the problem is, is success is about you. No matter what your success is, it's about you. If your, if your goal is to have so much money, it's so that you can have so much money. If it's to get a certain job, it's so that you can have a certain job. If it's to win a certain trophy, it's so you can tell all your friends about how you won that trophy. I pray, I do, I pray every one of you has success. And that's the thing with Dave Ramsey. He wants Christians to have money so that you can give. So that you can give, so that you can live a life of significance. You see, because success is about you. But significance is about other people. 
You see, there's a difference in success and significance. We can live our lives for success, and then when we get it, we can realize it was never enough, and we have wasted a lot of time because we finally have everything we ever wanted, and it's still not enough, and we still want something else. You ever got a new phone? I have. Almost every time a new one comes out. Guess what? I want the next one, and the next one, and the next one, because they've added the 17th camera or something. When you finally get what you want, when it is all about you, you will realize it is not enough and it is unfulfilling and it has not filled that void inside of you. And if we spend our lives chasing success, we'll do nothing but improve our lives to realize we're still not happy. But when we live a life of significance, we focus on other people. When we read the Gospels, we'll see Jesus. He lives a life of significance. He walks and he's not about glorifying himself all the time. He's about finding other people and helping and loving and healing and reaching out. Yes, it's all for the glory of God, but he lives a life of significance. And that's what he calls you and me to live, is a life of significance. And I feel like if we, if we live the Great Commission, we will live a life of significance. If we live a life where we want to go out and love people and reach people, and we are willing to pay the cost, we are willing to sacrifice, we are willing to face dangers, to face social, social isolation, if we are willing to go out and reach and love the world, we will live a life of significance. We will live a life of the calling of God and the image of God to be his representative to humanity, to creation. And my prayer is that there will be a movement of Christianity. There will be a movement of Christians that maybe it'll start right here in Cumberland County because people will leave here on fire for Jesus and you are willing because the cost is not greater than the reward. You are willing to be a little bit weird. You are willing to love those who are unlovable. You are willing to show mercy and kindness and grace and charity where it is available. You are willing to do what you must to make a difference because you know that the cost is not greater than the reward. Even if it costs you your own life to see someone else saved is amazing. It is incredible. It's the greatest thing you never see in your life. The cost is not worth the reward. What if you went out of here today, every one of you went out of here on fire for Jesus, for reaching people? Again, there's a church on every corner. Not a single one of them are full. I've talked to the pastors at most of the churches, and every one of them want to reach more people because there are people out in Cumberland County that still don't know Jesus, that they still don't know his grace. They still don't know his love. If anything, all they know is church people, and that might be why they don't know Jesus. So what if we left here not acting like church people, but acting like Jesus? What if we left here not judgmental, but in love? What if we left here with a passion to reach those that don't know Jesus, to, to love those that don't look like us, they don't sound like us, they don't talk like us, they don't, they don't work where we work, they don't show up where we show up, but we love them and we show them the love, grace, and mercy of Jesus anyway. What kind of difference could we make in our city? What kind of difference could we make in the world? There are 2.3 billion Christians and they need someone to follow. Will you be that person? Will you be the person that will go out and live a life of significance because the, the reward is definitely worth the cost? That to see people saved, to see people follow Jesus, it is your ultimate calling, it is your ultimate duty, it is your ultimate mission. So Christian, that is my call for you, to go out and live a life of significance. If you don't know what that looks like, that's great. That's great because there's a whole book written about what a life of significance is. And you can open up anywhere and you'll find it. I recommend starting in John and just keep reading. Read how Jesus acted. Read how Jesus talked. Read who Jesus interacted with. Read how Jesus loved. Read how Jesus gave. Read how Jesus handled altercations and he handled questions and he handled lost people. Read about how Jesus did it and go out and do it in your city. Then you will live a life of significance. And then, even if you die with nothing to your name, you will know your life mattered. Because one day all that money and all them trophies, they're going to fade away and there'll be nothing but a life of significance. If you can bring one person to Jesus, your life mattered. If you, can, if you can introduce one person to a church where they'll find Jesus, you made a difference. Live a life of significance. Now, if you're here and you're new to this whole church thing and you don't know about the whole Jesus thing and someone tricked you into coming here somehow, good job you. But if that's you, and you're still not sure about all of this and you're not sure why you should believe it, you're not sure if it's even for you, 
I have good news because when we read in Genesis 1, God says that all humanity is made in his image. So that's you. That is you. That God still has a calling, a purpose, and a reason for your life. And guess what? No matter how far gone you are, Listen, no matter how bad you've messed up, no matter what, what sins you've made, no matter what temptations you've fallen to, no matter what addictions you've crumbled to, no matter how defeating depression and anxiety may be on your life, no matter how unworthy you may feel here today, no matter how unlikely your life may be, God loves you, He is for you, and He is calling you into His kingdom, and He wants a relationship with you. Listen, one of my favorite scriptures is this. It's Romans 10, 9, and 10. And it's very simple. It says, if you declare with your mouth, if you say with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. If you would say with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You notice there's no other requirements. Listen, you don't have to do 10 years of perfection. You don't have to work seven years of work. You don't have to, to go out and, and give all your money away. No, you simply have to show up and say, Jesus, I believe you. I know that you died for my sins. I know I'm imperfect. I know I'm broken. I know I messed up 10 minutes ago. But Jesus, you love me anyway, and you died for my sins. You died for me that I may inherit eternal life. You died for me. You poured out your blood on my behalf. And Jesus, I'm unworthy. I repent of everything I've done. I, 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 I'm sorry for the mistakes I've made, but you died for me. I believe you are the Son of God. You are my Lord and you are my Savior. If you profess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. No other requirements. What happened yesterday doesn't matter. What happened 10 minutes ago does not matter. The life you've lived up to this single moment does not matter. The mistakes you've made, the addictions you've fallen to does not matter. The darkness and the storm you are currently in does not matter. All that matters is if you put your faith, hope, and trust in Jesus. Jesus came for all of humanity that he came and he died. And guess what? When he died, he knew all the sins you would commit. He knew all the mistakes you had made. He knew all the darkness you would give into. He knew all the terrible situations you'd be forced to live through. And he loved you and died for you. Because he loves you. And he wants a relationship with you. And he doesn't want you to be one of the 5.4 billion that don't make it home to him. He wants you to come home and spend eternity in his kingdom. If that's you today, now's the chance to say with your mouth, believe in your heart, and be saved. If that's you, I want to give you that opportunity. If everyone just bow your heads just a moment. We are just, we're, we're listing Romans 10, 9 here. If you would like to be saved, if you've never entered into a relationship with Jesus and you think today is the day that you want to make the change and you want to experience the glory he offers, if you want to experience the life he has for you and you want to give him all, if you're going to surrender all today, I want to give you that opportunity. All you have to do is say with your mouth that he is your Lord and Savior and believe in your heart that he died for you and God raised him from the dead. On the count of three, I'm going to give you that opportunity and I just want you to raise your hand. You can put it right back down and then we'll just we'll share a prayer together. If that's you and you want to make that decision today, raise your hand in one, two, three. Thanks. If that was you and you had your hand up, or even if you didn't, but you want to make that decision, you want to enter into that relationship with Jesus today, I just want you to pray with me. Repeat these words, pray them directly to Jesus. Where two or more gathered, He is in the midst. Say, Jesus. I thank you for all you've done. I come to you unworthy, broken, a sinner, but you love me anyway. Jesus, today, I make you my Lord and my Savior. I repent of my sins. I will focus on you. I believe you died for me and 
you are resurrected from the grave. You defeated sin and death. And from this day on, I will follow you. And one day I will join you in your kingdom. Amen. Let's just pray as a body. Father, I thank you for everything you do for us and you do through us, the amazing things you've blessed us with. I just pray that each and every person in here, God, that they would leave absolutely on fire for your mission, that we would go out and we would accomplish the Great Commission, that we would go out and we would wholeheartedly follow you. God, I pray that our hearts would break for those who don't know you, that those who are far from you, those that are destined to eternal damnation, God, I pray that our hearts would absolutely crush for them, so much so that we cannot go a single day without crying and weeping over their fate, so that we would go out and we would make a difference in this community. We would go out and make a difference to the people that we know, the people in our family, families, the people at work, the people that we can reach. We would use the people you've surrounded us with. We would use the platform you've given us to share your message, to share your gospel so that we could see this nation changed. We could see this world changed, God. If 2.3 billion Christians would get on fire for you, we could change this world. We could have peace once and for all. God, I pray that that wave would start right here in this sanctuary at this moment that we would go out with a passion and a drive to make a difference. And God, I pray if there's anyone here that they do not know you, Lord, that they would just know that no matter what, they are loved and they are adored and you shed your blood for them and you want them to come home. Lord, we thank you for everything you do. We thank you for who you are and that you made us in your image. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.